time, uh, we were probably familiar with storylines of amnesia. They crop up all the time in things ranging from cartoons to movies. So one of my favorite episodes of the Flintstones when I was younger was when uh, Fred gets a rock or bowling ball to the head um, that was put over the door, I think, by Barney, and it causes him to forget who he is and what he was doing. And then, of course, later in the episode, uh, he gets an additional bump to the head and his memory, of course, comes back. Um, <clears throat> we've also seen that uh, amnesia plot lines are staples in things like soap operas. So here's a still image from Days of Our Lives. Um, in this scenario, uh, there's a satellite, or there's a chip that's in Princess Gina or Hope's brain, and a satellite activates the chip and it erases her memory for one life of hers and puts in memories from another life. And of course, plot lines of amnesia are prevalent within movies, ranging from Born Supremacy to Memento and um, to Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Um, of course, a lot of these uh, <clears throat> storylines aren't very accurate. For instance, there's no place to go, at least that I know of, where you can get your memories of your ex-girlfriend, ex-boyfriend, ex-husband, or ex-wife erased from your brain. <laughs> and we don't quite have chips implanted in our brains, and hopefully we don't go running around um, banging each other on the head with rocks. Um, <clears throat> so what I'd like to do today is tell you a little bit about what amnesia is really like, um, what, it, <clears throat> what it sort of consists of. So in organic amnesia, what typically happens is that you have some kind of brain damage to the hippocampus or medial temporal lobe uh, within the brain. So the hippocampus is located within here. This is the medial temporal lobe of a healthy, a healthy adult, and what happens is that if you have a traumatic injury, such as an anoxic episode, or you have tumor removal, or so forth, um, you might end up with uh, the hippocampus being atrophied or just uh, removed uh, through a surgical procedure. So this is what happened to patient HM, who's one of the more famous cases of amnesia, and really uh, when he had, uh, he suffered from seizure activity that could not be controlled through medication, and so in the late 50s, um, surgeons removed the hippocampus within his medial temporal lobe. It stopped the seizure activity, but it left him with a profound memory impairment. So from that day forward, he was unable to form lots of new memories. Um, so we can see that this part of the brain is really uh, critical for the formation of new memories. So back to Hollywood for a moment. If you want to know if there's any film that tends to get it right or, uh, regarding the depiction of amnesia, Memento is actually a really good film to watch. Have you, have you seen it at all? I've seen, you seen, seen it. it? Yeah, it's a, great, it's a great movie. And so to give you a feel of what amnesia is actually like for a person on day-to-day -day basis, I'm going to hopefully play you a, a small little clip from this movie. It's my memory. Amnesia. The injury, I can't make new memories. Everything fades. Yes, I've already told you about my condition. Oh, well, only every time I see you. Okay. You don't remember where you've been or what you've just done. So for those of you who haven't seen Memento, it's a story of this man, Lenny, who as a result of a, a traumatic head injury, uh, he becomes profoundly amnesic. He has difficulties remembering who he's met, where he's met them, when he's met them, and has difficulty remembering what he's supposed to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, as a way of dealing with this memory deficit, he carries around a Polaroid camera and he takes pictures of people that he encounters. And he'll write down information about them, such as their name and their phone number, and little details of whether they're a person to be trusted or not to be trusted. Uh, so we can see what amnesia is really about. It's a problem in linking together arbitrary information in order to form a new memory that lasts uh, throughout, throughout time. And so because he has this particular deficit, he can't string together these arbitrary associations between, say, a person and a name and a place. He has to devise some external memory aids. In this case, he uses Polaroid pictures. He also tattoos certain facts uh, about his life and about his goal state on his body so that he can remember what he's supposed to do. And in this particular movie, um, his wife has been murdered, and so he's trying to find the killer of his wife. And so he's gathering clues throughout the movie, and he's either tattooing those clues on his body or taking Polaroids and putting pieces of information on there because he just can't string those pieces of information together to form a lasting memory. So we see that uh, in, in Hollywood, in this particular instance, and in 
real life, uh, amnesia is a deficit in binding together arbitrary associations. It's a deficit in making links among objects uh, so that we can remember where we were, with whom, and when. Now, unfortunately for me, we don't have a lot of amnesic patients running around to study, but we can see that there's a general concern uh, in the population about our memories, uh, even throughout the course of healthy aging. So for instance, there's songs that are written about memory. So this is a song by Tom Rush, and the lyrics go something like this. I won't sing, I won't torture you like that, but <laughs> like he says, looking for my wallet and car keys can't have gone too far. As soon as I find my glasses, I'm sure I'll see just where they are. <laughs> Supposed to meet someone for lunch today, but I can't remember where, or who it is that I'm meeting, it's in my organizer somewhere. <laughs> so the song goes on and on about he has how he's having some, some memory problems. Yes, mm -hmm. did you have a question? Oh, sorry. Um, so we can see that this concern about memory is, is within uh, is within music. Uh, we can see it in cartoons. So this is a gentleman uh, walking by a forgetfulness clinic, a subsidiary of whatchamacallit wellness group. <laughs> um, these are my grandparents up here, lovely people, but every time I see them, they always ask me what they can do to improve their memory. So they want to know um, if they should be writing themselves notes all the time, if that helps, or if they should be doing Sudoku or more crossword puzzles, you know, what can they possibly do to improve their memory and of course there's even um, uh, concerns that have infiltrated uh, social networking sites so uh, there's an account posted by a gentleman named Justin on Twitter in which he chronicles the things that his dad says uh, throughout the course of the day and in particular uh, this was a recent post he put on um, his dad said mom and I saw a great movie last night no I don't remember the name it was about a guy or no getting old sucks so we can see that this idea that there are memory problems even in healthy aging is, is prevalent throughout the culture. So one question is, well, are, are the memory impairments that we see in healthy aging, if there are memory impairments, do they resemble that that we see in amnesia? And that's a question um, that I'd like to tackle today. So uh, do older adults have a deficit in binding as well? Do they have difficulty making these arbitrary links among objects? There's one reason to think so. Um, as we get older, it turns out that our hippocampus undergoes some changes. So this is um, an image of the hippocampus for two different older adults. Um, and in this study, they were the authors were interested in examining whether there was atrophy that occurs <laughs> in the hippocampus, whether was, there's a decline in the structural volume of, the, of this particular region. Um, and what factors might predict whether or not uh, there's such a decline in the hippocampal region. And what we see is that the volume of the hippocampus might vary between different um, older adults, but you can see in particular here for this older adult, um, there's a lot of space around the hippocampus, so there's a significant amount of atrophy for this particular older adult. Um, and again, uh, you know, this study was interested in examining the kinds of factors that might relate to this kind of atrophy, but what's important for us here today is the fact that there is atrophy within the hippocampus. And if there is atrophy in the hippocampus, um, does that lead to particular kinds of memory deficits that might resemble those that we see in amnesic patients, which also has the hippocampus implicated? Uh, so I started my research career examining the kinds of memories that were impaired in amnesic patients. Um, and in particular, the way that I did this was to use eye tracking methods. So I would show people pictures and I would monitor their eye movements and use the way in which they move their eyes around the world to tell me something about what they remember. So I'll explain this in a bit more detail. So for instance, uh, you could show people a picture such as this one up here um, or this one over here and just tell them that you want to just see how they examine the picture. Later on, you can present them with either the same exact picture and monitor their eye movements. Um, so here, eye movements are depicted by these red lines, so that's oh, the wow. movement from one place to another. Um, the white plus signs, which might be a little hard to see, are where the eyes have stopped on that picture. And what I have outlined here in blue is a particular region of interest that I was interested in probing. So if you see this picture uh, once you know, throughout a, a given session, and you see this picture again, you can see that for this particular person, you know, the eyes travel over various regions within the scene along the river and the bridge and so forth, and a little bit here in this, in this walkway. Now you can imagine a different scenario where subjects are initially shown 
this particular scene where it looks exactly the same as this one except there are two girls here. And then later on, you can imagine that you show them a scene um, that is different. So the girls here have been removed from this picture here. And what I'm showing here is eye movements from one subject um, for whom they had initially studied this scene, but now we're given this one. And you can see that eye movements tend to be attracted to that spot where the girls used to be in the picture. So something in the picture has changed, and as a result, their eye movements are attracted to here. And you can compare these two um, and see that they're exactly the same scene. So these two people are viewing the exact same picture. The only difference is in their prior viewing history. So for this person, nothing had ever been in this particular region, and there's really no reason to go examine it further. Uh, for this person, there used to be a couple of girls in that particular region, and as a result, there's an increase in eye movements to that region. So what we see is that memory is affecting the way in which you scan uh, the scene itself, and you get increases to regions of change within a scene. So that tells us a bit about memory without actually having to ask people about what they remember. It turns out that if you test amnesia patients, such as uh, amnesia patient CA here, who had an anoxic episode, and as a result, her hippocampus uh, is a bit atrophied on both sides. Um, she doesn't show this effect, and neither do the other amnesia patients that we tested on this paradigm. So although if you're a healthy, neurologically intact adult, you get an increase in viewing to regions of change within a scene, amnesia patients don't. So this tells us that amnesia patients have a deficit in forming the links between the objects and their locations within a scene such that later they don't actually detect this change within a scene. Uh, a few years ago, we decided to see if we could do the same thing with older adults. So we wanted to know whether older adults had a similar kind of deficit in memory. And so this is from uh, our study with amnesia patients. Uh, with our older adults, we used different kinds of scenes so that we could get more trials in. So we would place three objects onto a background scene and then later we would move one of these objects around and we'd look to see whether people would notice with their eyes whether that object had been changed. And what I'm plotting here is how much looking time people direct to that changed object if it was embedded within a change scene or if it was embedded in a scene that had either just been repeated throughout the experiment in the same form or was brand new, that is their scene for the first time. And what we see for our younger adults here is that you get an increase in viewing to this particular region if that region is a region of change. And you get more viewing there compared to when um, there's no change there. So it's exactly what we had seen in our previous work. Um, however, this effect is absent in our older adults. So our older adults, like our amnesia patients in this eye movement paradigm, don't show evidence for remembering where objects are located within a scene. And so that was our first piece of evidence to suggest that maybe our older adults are actually a little similar to amnesia patients, a little bit scary, <laughs> in that they have some, um, they're not showing memory for where objects were located within space. Now, there's some differences between these two studies. Obviously, the instructions were a little bit different, the pictures were a little bit different, and so it's probably not fair to compare the older adults to the amnesia patients here, so we decided um, that we wanted to uh, back up a little bit and test this a bit more formally and do some studies in which we would compare uh, older adults directly to amnesia patients, and so that's what I'd like to talk about today. Um, so to, to recap, why should we compare older adults' uh, memory performance to that of amnesia patients? We've seen that both the amnesia patients and groups of older adults have some structural deficiencies in the hippocampus of the medial temporal lobe, and that region is really critical and important for forming new memories. Um, so if we compared memory performance between these two groups, we might get some insight into the function of the hippocampus in normal aging um, and see how memory survives in healthy aging. And also this helps us to get an understanding of just baseline memory performance in healthy older populations, so then we can compare their performance um, to uh, other to neuropsychiatric populations. Um, so for instance, understanding what healthy memory performance looks like in, in a healthy older adults allows us to then go see how does memory performance deviate in something like mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease, for instance. So how much different is, are those uh, kinds of diseases? And we know from some studies that, um, these are plots of the hippocampus, um, 
Uh, we know from other studies that there are regions of atrophy within the hippocampus that are correlated with whether a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is, is given. So we see that this is, again, a, a critical region to learn about in healthy aging and also uh, in other populations as well. And even in schizophrenia, we see that the structural integrity of the hippocampus is decreased for schizophrenic patients and their siblings compared to, to healthy control patients. So again, uh, having an understanding of how the hippocampus works in healthy younger and older adults allows us to get sort of a baseline level of understanding memory performance and hippocampal function, and then we can move on to these other uh, disease states or neuropsychiatric populations. So the objectives of the work that I'd like to present today is to try and uh, understand the nature of the memory impairment in amnesic patients, and further to understand and compare that with the nature of the memory impairment, if there is one, in healthy older adults, and also to explore avenues uh, to remediate those memory deficits where we see them. Uh, so how are we going to achieve these objectives? Uh, what I'd like to show you is some work in which we use behavioral paradigms that were initially done with animals. So we're going to take some really well-known experimental paradigms that were done uh, in rats and are known to really tap hippocampal function in rats. Uh, and we're going to take those paradigms, adapt them for humans, and compare performance between older adults and amnesic patients. And then we're going to, within those tasks, examine the conditions in which we might see improvements in binding or improvements in memory performance. So we're going to take uh, really well-studied uh, paradigms that have been tested uh, you know, throughout decades um, and take them into our, our human population. By the end, what I'd like to show you is that even though there are some memory difficulties in amnesic patients and in older adults, uh, that remediation of these memory deficits seems possible. So I'm hoping to end this talk on a positive note and you can see if that's right. So there are two paradigms that I'd like to walk you through today and, and the findings for each. Um, there's the transitivity paradigm and what's called the transverse patterning paradigm. And again, these have been studied extensively uh, with rats and we're gonna adapt them for humans and I'll, I'll, we'll walk through each of those paradigms in turn. So I'd like to give you sort of a, um, sort of a pop culture feel of what the transitivity paradigm is. Uh, so let's imagine that I have tickets to a hockey game. And uh, I only have two tickets, so I, I'm going to go, of course, and I'd like to bring a friend with me. And I have two friends, John and Mario. Um, each of them are equally good guys. Each of them love hockey equally. So which one do I take? Well, the person I take might depend on uh, what kind of tickets I have. So for instance, if I have tickets to the Toronto Maple Leafs, I'm actually going to take John because he's a huge Maple Leafs fan. Um, but instead, if I had tickets to the Chicago Blackhawks, I'm going to take my friend Mario because he's a huge Blackhawks fan. So I have two perfectly good choices of who to bring with me to the hockey game, but who I take actually depends on a larger context or bigger context. And you can keep, um, you can keep adding on these relationships. So uh, for instance, let's say now I have uh, three tickets to a hockey game. So I'm going to go, um, the tickets are for a Toronto Maple Leafs game, so I'm going to take my friend John. Um, but now who do I take? Who do I give that third ticket to? So I have two friends, uh, Jen and Stephanie. And so who I take to that game depends on their relationship with John. Um, so for instance, Jen and John actually get along really well, so I'm going to take her, but um, Stephanie and John have a little bit of a past, and so that might not be a comfortable situation, so I'm not going to take her to the hockey game. So you can see these are all a, a set of relationships um, that you can, you can learn, and you can make decisions based on what you know about the interplay of these relationships. And so this is really what the transitivity paradigm is. Given a given situation or a given object, such as A, um, which one are you going to pick? Which is the more appropriate choice to go with A? Is it either B or Y? And so in our test, we use objects um, to, uh, in place of these letters here, um, but you can imagine that they're similar to the situation where you have people and hockey tickets and so forth. Does that make sense? Um, so in this task, people have to learn uh, two sets of relationships. They have to learn that these four things go together, A, B, C, and D, and they have to learn that these four things go together. So 
Um, if given A, you're going to pick B and not Y. If given B, you're going to pick C and not Z. And if you're given C, you're going to pick D and not double Z. And we can use uh, different stimuli to probe these relationships or to have, or we ask people to learn uh, these two sets of relationships across different conditions. Um, and our conditions vary with the stimuli that we give to people. We can give them either familiar objects or novel objects, and we can vary the extent to which the relations among the objects were known prior to the experiment. And I'll walk you through this in a bit more detail. Um, in each of these conditions in which we vary the objects and their, their relationships is tested within each of the subject and they're tested separately. Um, so for instance, we tested each subject on a set of relations in which they already knew all of the objects and all of the relations among the objects were known prior to the experiment. So essentially, all they have to know or process is that this is a set of garden tools and this is a set of kitchen items. So for instance, if you're given the watering can, uh, you need to pick uh, that the spade or shovel goes with the watering can and not the, not the kitchen <coughs> pot. So again, all of these objects are familiar. All of these relationships were known prior to people coming uh, into, into our task. And then we have another condition, uh, which I call a pairwise relation condition. Um, so again, people have to learn that these four objects go together, and they have to learn that these four objects go together. And there are pairwise relationships that were already known prior to the experiment. So you can imagine that you already knew that um, yarn is uh, used to make a scarf. You wear a scarf when you go ice skating, and ice skating and baseball are both sports. Um, and this is both equipment to go to sports. But the relationships between, say, yarn and ice skates is a bit more arbitrary. So although the relationships are known within each pair here, if you start to go beyond the pairs, um, those are arbitrary relations that need to be learned within the confines of the experiment. We also have a condition in which uh, people need to learn that these four objects hang together and they're all familiar objects. Um, but there's no particular reason why keys should go with an umbrella or that a paintbrush should go with the keys. So these are all arbitrary relations that have to be learned within the confines of the experiment and then distinguished from this group of four. Again, familiar objects in which the relations among the objects have to be learned within the experiment. And then we have a condition in, we, in which we make life really hard and we present people with two groups of uh, novel objects. And so they not only have to learn the objects, but they have to learn uh, which groups they belong to. So again, we have novel objects with arbitrary relations that must be learned within the experiment. Uh, we tested a group of younger adults um, and a group of older adults in an amnesia patient DA uh, who, as a result of herpes encephalitis, was left with quite a bit of damage within his medial temporal lobe system uh, on both sides, as you can see in these images here. Um, and so the damage includes uh, the hippocampal structure, so we think he should be impaired in forming some of these memories and making these arbitrary links and understanding which objects hang together. Uh, so the task unfolds like this. I'm sorry for lots of details. Uh, the people would be given a particular context or what we call a sample item noted in red, and then they would have to make their, their choice of which of the objects goes with that sample item. And so they get a number of study blocks in which they study each of these pairs successfully, or successively, sorry, not successfully. Um, and eventually these presentations became random. And after every problem, we gave them some feedback about whether they were doing the task correct or not. In the test block, uh, we tested them on pairs that they had seen before um, during the study block. So for instance, if they were given A, they had to choose between B and Y. And we also gave them some new problems that they hadn't seen before to see if they understood uh, the relations between the objects. So for instance, we gave them what I call a one-away relation pair. So if given A, they have to choose between C or Z. This is a problem that they hadn't studied before. But if they had learned that these four things hang together, that A goes with B and B goes with C, then this problem should be fairly easy for them to do. And then we have two-away relation pairs. And then finally, we have a mixed relation pair in which you can see that one object is one away from that sample item, and then the other object is two relationships away from that sample item. And we don't give them any feedback. So here they don't know whether they're doing the task right or wrong. We just want to see if they, what they've learned about the relations. 
So here what I'm plotting is uh, the accuracy, so how correct subjects are um, for our four different conditions for uh, the familiar objects with known relations, this is the garden tools and the kitchen items, um, the pairwise relations, the familiar objects in which um, all the relations are arbitrary, and the novel objects in which all the relations are arbitrary. And here what I'm showing is just the data from the younger adults, and you can see that younger adults actually do very well, um, get above 85% on all the conditions, and they do, of course, best on distinguishing garden tools from um, the kitchen objects, but they do pretty well on all of the conditions. So critical question is how do the older adults now fare? So the older adults are now plotted in red, and you can see that older adults do just as well on the younger adults in distinguishing um, kitchen tools from garden tools. Um, they do just as well as the younger adults on the pairwise relation condition, um, so which uh, there are some relationships that they already knew prior to the experiment. But older adults start to fall off quite dramatically when uh, they must learn all new relations uh, in the experiment. And so critical question now is how does DA do? And um, does DA do DA and the older adults actually perform um, quite similarly? So what we see is that for DA, DA does just as well as the older adults and the younger adults when all he has to do is process known relationships. He's known these things long before his injury, so his performance here is fine. But you can see that DA falls off on any condition in which he has to learn even some of uh, the relations that are arbitrary. So even in this pairwise condition, um, some of those relations to be learned are arbitrary and he falls off quite dramatically. What's critical though is this condition where we see that both the older adults and DA are not performing well, they're performing at chance. So basically DA and the older adults are just guessing. So we can see on this hardest condition, our older adults actually look quite a bit like our amnesic patient, um, which is um, a bit sobering perhaps. So um, this study tells us uh, with respect to amnesia and aging that DA has marked impairments in learning arbitrary relations and is likely due to his compromised medial temporal lobe and hippocampal function. Um, but our older adults also seem to have some difficulties on this task, which uh, suggests that um, perhaps the hippocampus is, uh, is compromised in the older adults, similar to that of DA, because they're having difficulty on the most difficult uh, piece of our task. Uh, so one question is whether there are any conditions within the experiment that might actually improve binding both for our older adults and for our amnesia patients. And to show you that there is some hope, I'd like to go back um, to some of the results from the older adults and I'll show you that if you train new relations uh, in the context of information that the older adults already knew, that you can actually see a boost in performance. So what I'm showing here is just the data from the older adults and showing the data from the pairwise relation condition in which uh, the older adults knew that the yarn was used to make the scarf and the scarf was, uh, was worn ice skating that these two are sports and contrasting that to performance where all of the objects again were known but these relations are all arbitrary. So I'm comparing the pairwise relation condition in dark red to the arbitrary relation condition in a lighter red. And what you can see is that um, in, when you're tested on those studied pairs, so they're pairs that you got throughout the experiment, older adults are doing better uh, for those pairwise relation problems than for the arbitrary relation problem. This is probably not surprising. They knew beforehand that the yarn is used to make a scarf and there's no reason beforehand to know that the keys and the umbrella go together. So this piece is not surprising. You know, they're doing better for processing relations that they already knew prior to the experiment. What's critical here, though, are these other test problems, the one-away, the two-away, and the mixed problems. So in both conditions, these problems are testing arbitrary relations. Um, so for instance, you're testing whether the yarn goes with the ice skates or with the paintbrush, or you're testing whether um, the, uh, sorry, um, the umbrella goes with the, with the paintbrush here. So it's always an arbitrary relationship that you're testing, um, even, even though they're learned within a pairwise condition or in a completely arbitrary condition. And what you see is that the older adults do much better if they're learning new relations in the context of already known information than if they're learning relations in a context where they know absolutely nothing about the relationships. So you can see that appealing to existing knowledge or training new knowledge 
in the context of existing knowledge is actually boosting up memory performance for the older adults. So when we examine conditions that improve binding, we see that appealing to this prior knowledge can actually help older adults learn new information and incorporate these new relations into an existing framework. So the question is, how does this actually compare to our amnesia patient? Does he similarly benefit? So here, what I'm plotting are the results uh, in this pairwise relationship condition for the younger adults in black, the older adults in red, and DA, our amnesia patient in purple. And again, we're looking at the study problems and then the one-way, two-way and mixed pairs. And you can see that DA does just as well as the younger and the older adults for processing known relations. He knows that um, the yarn goes with the scarf, so this isn't a problem. He knew that long before his injury. Um, but you can see that on any of the other problems in which it's an arbitrary relation that has to be learned, uh, he falls off dramatically. Uh, so he cannot uh, use this existing framework to build up new relationships. So unlike the older adults who really do benefit from being in this pairwise condition, um, this actually does not help DA at all. So DA can't incorporate new information into an existing framework unlike our older adults. Um, so we see one method of remediating some memory deficits. We see that appealing to an existing framework of knowledge can actually improve memory for older adults when they have to bring in new information, but this just doesn't seem to work for our amnesia patient. And at the end, uh, I'll talk about some reasons why I think that is. So just a quick overview before we go to the second part. So in terms of our objectives of understanding the nature of the memory impairment in amnesia and in healthy aging and exploring some ways in which we can remediate these deficits, um, we see that amnesia patients have a deficit in binding or linking together uh, objects due to their hippocampal dysfunction. Um, and we see a similar deficit in healthy older adults likely due to hippocampal atrophy as well. Um, but we see that for our older adults, uh, appealing to an existing relational framework can really help boost up some memory performance. And although I didn't show this data here, it also seems that just having extra practice with the task can also improve memory performance for the older adults. Um, but these things do not work for our amnesia patients. <clears throat> so those were the findings from our transitivity test. I'd like to show you some findings from our transverse patterning test, again, a task that was taken from the animal literature and applied here to humans, um, in which we're going to see a similar story emerge that there are deficits in linking objects together uh, for both the amnesia patients and uh, for the older adults. Um, and while we see that older adults can appeal to existing knowledge to improve their performance, our amnesia patient does something a little different and that'll give us some insight into uh, the nature of memory itself. So transverse patterning is just really rock, paper, scissors. Um, <clears throat> so all the transverse patterning task is is that you have three different objects and when you're given two, you have to pick which one wins, and which one wins sort of depends on which two that you've given to people. So is everyone familiar with the rock, paper, scissors test? Anyone not? So, so rock, paper, scissors, for those of you who may not be, because it, 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 not everyone's familiar with, it, with this test, as, as I found out, um, <clears throat> and it's not prevalent in all cultures either. So for instance, the, these, these two hand signals are showing paper and they're showing scissors. And so scissors cuts paper, <clears throat> so scissors wins in this case. If this person were showing um, a fist, that would be a rock symbol, and paper covers rock. So a paper can win or a paper can lose depending on the stimulus that that paper is paired with. So you always have three objects, and sometimes the objects win and sometimes the objects lose, but it really depends on the relationship with the other object. And so we had uh, younger adults and older adults and some amnesic patients do uh, some variants of the rock, paper, scissors test, and we'll step through that in a moment. Um, so we had uh, two different groups of younger, we had two groups of younger and older adults, and we had additional groups of older adults to serve as controls for amnesic patients, and you'll see, you'll see why in a moment. Um, and we included amnesia patient KC, who as a result of a motorcycle accident had a closed head injury and um, sustained some severe uh, damage to uh, his medial temporal lobe system, which is quite extensive um, on both sides, and, hip and the hippocampus, um, of course, is severely damaged. 
So in transverse patterning, again, you get two stimuli, and you need to, in this case, it would be an object as denoted here by either A or B, and you have to pick which one wins. And uh, you get uh, uh, these problems over and over again. So you have three different stimuli, A, B, and C, and there's three different problems, an A versus B problem, a B versus C, and an A versus C problem. And you get these problems over and over and over again, and you get some feedback so you can eventually learn through trial and error which one actually wins. Um, and then we give people a test block immediately following training in which they get random presentations of these three problems, and we don't give them any feedback of whether they're getting the problems right or not. So we had three different groups of subjects. Uh, we put them in three different conditions, what I'll call the alone condition, the practice condition, and the semantic condition. Um, critically to note is that people in all three of these conditions were, had to perform the transverse patterning task with uh, geometric shapes and with uh, abstract objects as the stimuli. So in one uh, study test session, they would get, say, these three stimuli um, that served as the A and the B and the C, and they would get problems with those stimuli in which they had to pick which one wins. Um, and they would also get a study and test session with these abstract objects, and everyone got these kinds of problems. The critical piece is what comes before um, doing those test blocks. So, oops, sorry. So either <laughs> subjects could get no training prior to getting these um, to getting transverse patterning with either the shapes or the objects, or they would get quite a bit of practice. So they would get um, another session of uh, using geometric shapes or using abstract objects prior to getting these two um, critical ones here. Or we actually provided them with a rock, paper, scissors test. So we tried to make little card stimuli um, that show um, the hand signals for the rock and the paper and the scissors. So they would get that first and they would understand that they're playing the rock, paper, scissors game. And we'd also give them a session in which we use playing cards in which um, they, would, they would know that the, you know, an ace can be treated as either high or low in many card games. So in this case, you could have ace beat the king and king beat the two, but two when paired with, would win over the ace. So you can see that each of those cards um, can win or it can lose, but it depends on which one it's paired with. And so they would get that as well, and we call this the semantic condition because people already knew this knowledge prior to coming into the experiment. So this was already maintained within their semantic knowledge store, and then we would give them the geometric shapes and the abstract objects plot. And so what we wanted to know is whether performance on these two sets of uh, um, study test blocks would improve if you got some additional practice beforehand and also if you could appeal to some existing knowledge within memory beforehand. And so here what I'm showing is the accuracy, so how well people were doing on this task for younger and older adults. Um, the younger adults are in these darker colors, the older adults are in these lighter colors, and we have the alone condition, the practice condition, and the semantic condition. And what you can see is that in the alone condition, the older adults are not doing um, as well as the younger adults. So regardless of whether they're being shown um, the abstract objects or the geometric shapes, um, the kind of stimuli doesn't really matter, they're just not doing as well for picking the correct object compared to uh, the younger adults. Now if you give everybody some extended practice before you get to these blocks, you can see that performance uh, dramatically improves for the older adults. They're not doing as well as the younger folks, but they're doing much, much better. And finally, if you trained uh, them up first on the explicit rock, paper, scissors condition and with the playing cards, now you see that performance is really quite good for the older adults. And in fact, if you take into account their level of education and their level of vocabulary before they come into the experiment, we find that there's actually no difference between younger and older adults in this condition. So we see that training up new relations in the context of already known information does seem to work for older adults and can improve their memory performance. Uh, so again, uh, we see that older adults, if you gave them the transverse patterning task just alone, seem to have some deficits in binding. They seem to have difficulties knowing which object wins depending on what it's paired with. But if you train it up in an existing relational framework in which they can understand relationships and already knew about those relationships, then you can see improvement in performance. And also if you just give them general practice with the task, that seems to help as well. 
So one question is, how do these older adults compare with our amnesic patients? We gave our two amnesia patients, KC and DA, oh, we always gave them the semantic condition. So we always started them with rock, paper, scissors and the playing cards condition because we wanted to make sure that they understood what we were testing them with. And these were things that they were familiar with beforehand. Um, in particular, KC tends to play solitaire quite a lot, so he's really familiar uh, with playing cards. And so these are busy slides, what I'm going to show you over the next, uh, the next few slides. So I'll, I'll try to walk you through them as best as I can. Please let me know if something does not make sense. So what we're doing is we're comparing the performance of the accuracy here for KC in these red color bars and DA in these green color bars um, to that of uh, healthy subjects in and the blue color. And we can see that everyone does really well um, on rock, paper, scissors. So that's good, our amnesia patients understand the test, so now we can go probe some harder things. Um, so you'll see that in the playing cards, our amnesia patients do pretty well, but there's some times where they just fall off dramatically um, during this test block. And so um, I was a little curious when we would probe them about what they, uh, what they knew about these relationships, and it turns out that um, it was hard for them to hold online the fact that the two could beat the ace. So they would tend to treat um, the ace as high all the time. So they would do just fine during the study portion, but as soon as you stopped giving them feedback and you had a little bit of a delay, then they would forget that rule um, that two could be the ace, and that's why you see some declines in performance there. On our geometric shapes condition, you can see um, that our, our healthy older adults do, do fairly well, um, again, because they've been trained in this sort of semantic context. Um, KC does not do very well on this task, um, but DA does actually somewhat okay. And also on our abstract objects condition, even though KC falters here quite a bit, he has difficulty learning new relations, um, we see that DA does really well. So this is a little curious because we saw before that DA doesn't do well in learning new relations, but here on these two conditions, he seems to do just fine. So we thought, okay, well maybe uh, this task is easy. He can hold on the rules between these three objects uh, very well. Um, so maybe he has superior working memory abilities, so let's bring him back after an hour and see how he does. So we would train him up and then take him to lunch, have lots of conversations, and bring him back and test him again. Um, again, on rock, paper, scissors, and playing cards just to make sure uh, he was, you know, understood the task and was doing just fine. Um, and you can see he does DA when compared to our controls here, does just fine on the rock, paper, scissors um, across uh, four different sessions. Again, he does pretty well for the playing cards, but sometimes he does forget that the two can be high and can beat the ace. Um, but you can see that he's still doing just fine on the geometric shapes condition. Um, so this isn't due to the fact that he's holding the rules online in memory. When you ask him if he did anything earlier that morning on the computer or what he did, he won't remember, he can't tell you. If you ask him if he's seen the shapes of word, he'll say maybe because he figures that's what he should say because you're testing him and he was probably there earlier doing something, but he doesn't remember what. So this is a bit curious, and we see that he falls off in the abstract objects condition. Uh, so we wanted to know how he's performing so well here. He seems to be learning something about the relationships among the objects, so what is that and why can't KC do it? So we asked the patients to tell us about how they did the experiment. So um, how did you decide which object wins if I gave you two objects? And DA would say things like, um, well, you know, the star fills the bucket, so the star wins, and the bucket covers the rainbow, so uh, the bucket wins. Um, and so when we asked him if he had sort of a general strategy, he would say, well, I, I tried to pick the object that could cover the other or the other object that could beat up the other object. <laughs> so he would make them interact in some kind of way. Um, but KC, who was reliably impaired on any condition in which uh, he had to learn new relationships, would just select the one that seemed better. He didn't seem to have a strategy. Uh, so it appeared that DA would attempt to fuse the objects into a single overlapping unit. He would have the objects interact in some way together, but KC wouldn't. So we started to think that perhaps uh, DA isn't really learning about the relations among the objects, but he's taking two separate objects and fusing them together in such a way or in such an image that he can then derive the relationships later. Um, so he's not learning about relations among objects, he's learning about a single object. 
so we thought if this is really true, if he's unitizing information in this way, then perhaps we can exploit his strategy or probe it in a bit, a bit more detail. Uh, so what we did in some follow-up work with DA was to show him movies in which objects would interact in some kind of way. So we wanted to give him a transverse patterning task again with three new objects, but we wanted to see if we could exploit his unitization strategy. Um, so we would show him movies where, say, a plus sign would come over and cover a circle, or a crescent moon would uh, move over and stab the plus sign, or um, the uh, circle would uh, come down uh, from above and squish the crescent moon. So these are all kinds of relationships that DA was already talking about beforehand, and so we implemented those into little movies uh, with new objects, and then what we would do during a training session would be to provide um, the two separate stimuli as we had done before, but then give this uh, sort of final unitized image in the middle as a hint. So we would say to DA, well, we're going to show you some movies in which the objects are interacting, and you can see that one is going to win over another, and then later we're going to give you these problems, we'll give you a hint in the middle. So we're going to show you that final unitized image um, in which one object is clearly winning over the other one, and see how that affects performance. Uh, so we had the same procedures as before with the differences noted in red. We showed DA some movies. We gave him lots of training with the unitization image provided in the center. Uh, we gave him test blocks immediately and after a one hour delay in which um, the unitization image was no longer presented so it resembled the test blocks that we had done before so we can see if we could boost up performance uh, uh, for DA, particularly in the abstract objects condition in which he had failed before. Uh, so here what I'm showing is the accuracy for DA uh, for the rock, paper, scissors, the shapes condition in which he either was given those unitized movies or was not, and the abstract conditions in which he was given the unitized movies or not, and we are also showing uh, the findings from KC as well to see if we can boost up KC's performance. And so this is a one hour delay test where you get training, you have lunch, we do lots of chit chat, and you come back and get a test. And you can see that DA and KC can do rock, paper, scissors just fine. So again, we know that they're both having good days and they understand the instructions. And so in the geometric shapes condition for DA, we can see that he's still doing just as well as he did before. Um, so he's implementing some strategy that seems to work for him. And you can see that the first time when we test him on the unitized condition for the shapes, he doesn't do well at all. Turns out he didn't like my explanation of the movies. <laughs> so he saw the movies, but he interpreted them as something a bit different. So the movies looped around. So instead of seeing a ball uh, squish a crescent moon, he saw a crescent moon flinging the ball up into the air. So he reversed the relationships um, from what I had intended him to, to actually have. Um, so I brought him back another time and explained that the uh, uh, the movies would loop around and asked him to you know, explain the relationship he saw in between the objects. And he sort of liked my movie, sort of didn't. He said, well, yeah, I see what you're trying to say with the ball squishing the crescent moon, but you could think of it in this other way. And of course, uh, you can see that half the time he gets the answer right and half the time he doesn't. Third time I brought him back, he seemed perfectly comfortable with my explanations of the movies, and, uh, and it seemed that he held on to that throughout training and throughout tests and seems to do just well here. So you see that there's a difference in performance depending on whether he's agreeing with what, uh, with what my interpretation is or is not, and so that gives us an important clue that sometimes memory strategies have to be actually derived from within. The person needs to be in control of those kinds of memory strategies. Um, but you can see that uh, uh, DA doesn't do well on the abstract objects. Condition doesn't matter if we gave him this unitized training or not. Here he doesn't seem to do well. For KC, this unitization strategy doesn't do anything for him. Um, he doesn't ever improve. So we wanted to bring DA back um, to test him in some additional sessions to see um, if this would hold up. We think that unitization was actually the strategy he was trying to implement because otherwise this wouldn't have interfered with him here. Um, so if he was doing something completely different from unitization, um, he probably would have done just fine ignoring my strategy on this task and, and instead implementing his own. Um, so we brought him back for three additional sessions. Um, again, rock, paper, scissors, he does perfectly. Geometric shapes condition, again, this is even after an hour delay, he does perfectly, so he's uh, learning something about how the objects are related to one another. 
Um, we see that if he's performing the abstract object's condition without um, the unitized movie provided, he does not do well, and in two sessions he actually gets them all wrong, so he gets the relationships completely in reverse. Um, but you can see after a while, unitization actually improves his performance for the abstract object's condition. Um, so this takes a little bit longer, but eventually the movies seem to help DA here, and it's possible that he had to learn something about the objects first in order to get the unitization to work, whereas here he already has um, these objects within memory. Um, he knows what circles are, knows what crescent moons are, and perhaps it was easier to make a unitized image to support performance here, but it took a little while longer here because he had to derive something new. Uh, so some conclusions from, from this study, um, in looking at the memory impairment in amnesia and aging and seeing if we could explore some methods to remediate those deficits, uh, we see that amnesia patients again are showing uh, deficits uh, in binding or learning new relations among objects, likely due to that hippocampal damage that the patients had. Um, our older adults also seem to show some deficits in learning new relations among objects, and again, likely due to some deficiencies in the hippocampal system. Um, and what we see is that for our older adults, when you can train new information in the context of something they already knew, you get improvements in performance. And you also get improvements in performance if older adults could just have some practice with the task. Um, this doesn't seem to work with our amnesia patients, and instead at least one patient seems to use a unitization strategy. Um, so that patient is using something very different from what our older adults used. Um, so some general techniques for memory re rehabilitation for our older adults, we see uh, cross two experiments that practice works and training new knowledge in the context of something that people already knew seems to work as well. Um, why does this not work for amnesia patients? I think it doesn't work because you actually need some viable functioning hippocampal tissue in order to make that happen. Um, so we know from some work from Ira Driscoll um, that performance on the transverse patterning task is really related to the integrity of the hippocampal volume. So the more hippocampal volume you have, the better off you are at doing, uh, doing this task. If you don't have uh, much viable hippocampal tissue, as in the case of our amnesic patients, it seems that they can't, uh, they can't really do that task in the same way that older adults could. Also, there's some evidence from uh, the rat literature that you also need the hippocampus even when you're trying to integrate um, new knowledge into something you already had. Um, so in this study, uh, uh, rats had to learn uh, uh, associations between particular odors and particular places. Um, and so that's what's depicted up here, that they had to learn that you could find a particular odor in this location um, you know, as represented by, by this grid here. Um, and so the, the animals could do that just fine, but after you have, um, and they were actually faster to incorporate new knowledge, um, new place and odor associations, if they've already learned some before in that room, um, but the fact remained that if you had some hippocampal damage, they could not do that. So even though uh, you could learn uh, these new associations faster and better and they were longer lasting, um, you still needed a hippocampus in order to do that. So even though the hippocampus isn't the repository for things you already know, you still need it in order to incorporate new information into that already existing information. So it's possible that appealing to existing knowledge doesn't work for amnesic patients because they don't have enough viable functioning hippocampal tissue, whereas our older adults do have something to hang on to. Uh, there's other research in the literature that suggests other ways we can rehabilitate uh, memory function in older adults. So there's some nice work from Kirk Erickson and Art Kramer that suggests aerobic activity might actually be associated with um, increased integrity of the hippocampal system, um, which hopefully would lead to improved memory performance. Um, the study that I had started off with, which looked at structural integrity of the hippocampus in older adults, suggests that lifelong activity um, a lifelong mental activity is associated uh, with um, less of a decline or less of an atrophy in the hippocampal system, and so that could help hopefully preserve um, some, uh, some memory function. And one thing we're exploring is whether the way in which we move our eyes around the world actually has some consequence for what we remember later on. So this is 
a line of research we're still looking at, but there's enough research in the literature that suggests that eye movements are critical for laying down memory representation. So you can, you're better off remembering a face if you can actually uh, uh, move your eyes across that face than if you have to hold still or at fixation in the center of it. So it seems that scanning behavior is really critical for building up information in memory, and so it's possible that we could use scanning behavior as a, a remediation tool for older adults, but we can see if that actually works. So we saw that for um, our amnesic patients, they had to, at least for DA, he had to rely on something very different. He had to invoke a unitization strategy. Uh, one question is why this doesn't work for all amnesic patients. So it seemed to work for DA, but it didn't work for KC, so why is that? Um, DA tends to be much more verbal than KC, and you can see that his strategies were a bit verbal. He was in, uh, invoking a verbal explanation and perhaps deriving an image from that. So it's possible that unitization, in this case at least for him, really relies on that preserved language or vivid imagination or, or something that's a, that KC doesn't seem to invoke. So we're still exploring why that, um, what that difference is. Um, another question is why doesn't it work for all tests? So we could see that DA didn't do very well on our transitivity test, but he did just fine on our transverse patterning test. Um, so it's possible that it only works in the situations in which you have a limited amount of information that you can unitize. So when you had to um, figure out which friend of yours you would take given the context of the hockey tickets, it's possible that unitizing all of that information doesn't work because you have the wrong answer embedded in with the right answer and you can't make them conjoin in such a way that you can derive the correct answer from it. So it's possible that there's a limit to what you can uh, unitize in order to derive the right relationship, but that's something that we need to explore as well. Another question is why was it more difficult for DA to succeed on the abstract objects condition even when he's invoking unitization? And again, I alluded to this idea that um, perhaps he needed to build up um, the representation of abstract objects in memory first or while he was unitizing them, where, whereas with uh, known geometric shapes, perhaps he already has that in memory to work with and it was perhaps easier or faster in order to build a unitized image. And so further question is, would unitization strategies work for older adults? And that's something we can explore if we can get some very difficult tests um, and perhaps unitization might be a good uh, memory strategy um, in cases where performance uh, has dropped quite a bit and it doesn't seem to that appealing to an existing framework um, it will, will work in particular tasks. So um, that's something we can explore. So again, we'd like to explore this idea of unitization. We'd like to do some um, imaging work with older adults in DA on the transverse patterning test to see exactly what brain systems are being used to make that unitized image and to see a difference between the way in which DA does that versus the way in which older adults do that. So we should see different networks coming online to support performance in that task as a result of their different strategies. And so the more that we can pin down what strategies they're using under what conditions and what brain systems uh, they're invoking to do those strategies, we might be able to uh, tailor some remediation techniques. Um, and again, we could see if unitization is actually invoked as a strategy in older adults, perhaps as a task it's more difficult. So they might switch strategies um, depending on the difficulty of the task or time limits and so on. Um, so we can explore those conditions. Um, and finally, we see that there's, um, there's some ways to remediate uh, memory deficits in older adults, but these are really contrived laboratory tests, and so um, unless people are going to a rock, paper, scissors uh, a, you know, competition, then perhaps um, we need to invoke some more real life or real world kind of situations in which you can um, train older adults to use their existing knowledge to learn new information and see if they can do that on the fly. Um, so you can see that there's still a lot of work to be done. And although I've shown you a lot of uh, depressing news in the fact that there are memory deficits that seem to be exhibited by older adults and amnesic patients, I hope what I've shown you is that perhaps uh, remediation of memory deficits is indeed possible and that there are ways to work towards some cognitive rehabilitation of memory. Um, and so, of course, uh, none of this work would have been possible without a large cast of, of characters. Uh, in, particularly, in particular, Melanie Ostreicher is a med student here at University of Toronto, and she spearheaded a lot of the studies 
uh, with the older adults. Um, and Sandra Moses is here at the Hospital for Sick Children. And she, uh, along with Shana Rosenbaum, were critical uh, in doing the unusual work. So thank you very much for your attention. When you talk about the older adults, is there a certain age group? Uh, that's interesting. So we typically recruit adults who are 60 and over, and they tend to be 65 and older. Um, one thing that I would like to do is examine across the lifespan to see where performance is really changing, um, and to see under what circumstances you might see really fantastic performance for an 80-year-old versus um, really not so great performance for an 80-year-old, uh, for instance, because there's lots of factors that might contribute to when you see good performance and when you see bad for performance. But um, for ease of recruitment, we tend to uh, bring in um, usually 60 and older because those folks tend to be the ones who are retired and tend to be the ones who are interested in doing research, so it's a little easier to bring those folks into research studies. Yes? What controls are you putting on in case you drug Uh, that's interesting. Uh, so we generally look for the older adults. Um, we look to see that they have not had a history of head trauma in, of any, in any case. Uh, we also ask that they, um, we also screen for depression as well because there is there does seem to be a link between, uh, in some cases or some publications anyway, between uh, depression and memory. Um, other than that, we tend to not screen um, for other kinds of drugs. So it's mainly a history of head trauma and depression that we screen for. Because there are drugs that affect memory. Certainly, yes. Yes, certainly. So um, that's certainly something that we could factor out on a much uh, more large scale study if we were able to, you know, if we recruited hundreds and hundreds of people, then we could sort of partial out differences due to different kinds of medications. There's such a wide variability in the medications that people present with when they come into our studies that we haven't done that but, um, as, as yet, but that's something that we could certainly address um, and hopefully something we could address with some other folks in the Rotman who are interested in large population studies. Any other questions? Yes. I just wanted to say it was a very interesting talk. Thank you. And uh, it's, it's uh, quite stimulating to, to think about how we might uh, reduce the, the inevitable decline of, of learning and memory. Right. Do you have any suggestions of a concrete, specific nature, um, you know, along the lines of do crosswords really help right. or <laughs> right. to memorizing poetry, does that really help? Or Right. So my, my best advice from what I've, what I've seen so far is that aerobic activity certainly helps in multiple aspects of cognition. There seems to be quite really uh, striking evidence with respect to that. Um, can you recover it if you, you know, they say with muscles that no matter how old you are, if you start lifting weights, it's going right. to improve your, your uh, right. performance. You definitely the see same? You definitely see improvements <coughs> in, in a variety of cognitive tasks from the attention to memory tests with the, with the um, inclusion of aerobic exercise, so you'll see, you'll see improvements there. Um, the other the other piece I would suggest is just be as active as possible and have a wide range of activities, um, mental Come activities. Come to lectures. Come to lectures. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you can do volunteer work, take other courses, um, anything to keep you engaged intellectually and socially. Um, you know, as as the one study suggested, a sort of lifelong mental activity have a, a protective effect. And then of course as, as you need to remember new information, you know, to the extent that you can um, reflect on that new information and tie it to something you already know, that might that might help on a day-to-day -day basis as well. Is that possibly one of the links between the fact that supposedly um, the more education you have to start with, the uh, slower the decline might be. It's I don't know yeah, that's it's, actually. It's possible. It's possible that it, the the more <coughs> likely you are to incorporate that new knowledge into existing knowledge, and if you had a, have a, um, a 
sort of wide repository of, of already known information that gives you the ability to make links in different areas or gives you more options to make links. So um, that could be the source of that those kinds of findings that you're just able to integrate that new information into a whole variety of different topics of, of existing information. So it's possible. It'd be something interesting to explore. Where exactly is the helpful ambos in the head? Where is it? It's in the middle in here. <laughs> it's in the middle. So it's deep. It's deep in here. So it's a. It's a. Um, so sorry. I should have. I should have oriented better. Uh, so go back to. Okay. So. Sorry. I should have oriented you on the slide. So here. Here you're taking a slice through through the head in this way, um, so you're getting a slice about here, and these structures are sitting are sitting sort of deep within within that, so close to the middle. Um, and here, what you're seeing is this is the front of the head, the eyes here, this is the back of the head, and I should use one of these things. <laughs> so you can see the hippocampus is here on the other side. Um, so again, you're looking at a slice that's going this way in the head. And it's, it, and it's situated sort of in, in the middle. That's how big is it? Uh, it's interesting. It's, it's shaped like a seahorse, which is actually how it gets its name. So hippocampus right. is Latin for, for seahorse. And so it's a small structure um, as far as width, but it, it, it has a bit longer of a length, just like a, like a seahorse. So if you imagine a seahorse sort of turned on its side and stuck in the middle of your brain, that's kind of what, you know, what it looks like. <laughs> I've read somewhere that uh, where you locate the long-term memory is somewhere there, and then for short-term memory, it is somewhere here. They are not uh, situated in the same position? Not necessarily. So there's some debate on whether there's actually a difference between long-term memory or short-term memory. But that aside, um, what you find is that the, there are different processors within the brain that are important for um, uh, for decoding particular types of information. So for visual information, you would get uh, these posterior regions, back of the head, um, visual cortex processing that. So it's likely that um, the memory for, for instance, different elements of a scene are stored here in, in those kinds of cortical processors. But what the hippocampus does is, uh, is to link that information together. So you have some connections among um, neural regions. Um, that are brought together in the, in the hippocampus. Um, so your memories are sort of stored throughout as um, different pieces or different units in the hippocampus might um, serve as a pointer to where those different units are located within the brain. Because it often happens with me that things that happened way, way many, many years ago, I still remember, mm -hmm. but what happened to me, say, Sure. Five minutes ago or yesterday, I don't remember. Sure, that's that's um, very typical because you can think that the memories that you have from long ago are those that you've rehearsed quite a bit and you've told quite a bit and you've reactivated them a lot. So those are actually stronger. They have um, stronger connections between all of those units than a memory that you've just laid down a week ago. So um, reactivating those memories and um, replaying them and you have memories of when you told that story to somebody else throughout the years. Those are all different links and different units that get tacked onto the memory and make that a, a bit stronger than something that you, you've just had for a week or so. Yes. I, I'd love to hear you comment a bit on, on the relationship between memory and, and in older adults and speed and distraction. Um, I don't know if anybody else has the same problem with watching the new uh, revamped uh, CBC national news. <laughs> yeah. I find it extremely annoying to sure. have the, the constant distraction of the graphics floating sure. along with no context, no relationship to anything else. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. They're, I mean, to some to some extent, these things are really tied. So um, you're going to have better memory for those things that you can pay attention to. And if you are distracted by lots of other elements, then you might not be able to devote enough processing time to any of those elements to get it really strongly laid down in memory. Um, there does seem to be 
um, something about the binding of the memory itself um, that is impaired in older adults separate from the attention or distraction piece. Um, and so that, that's something that we explored in one of our, one of our other studies. So we, we um, asked people to be distracted in a particular way or we forced them to be distracted and we examined um, their memory for that distraction. So if older adults are distracted more than youngers, you should actually see a situation where older adults should have a better memory than youngers because they're devoting more time to that piece that they should have really been ignoring. And it turns out that they still show some memory deficits even for that distracting piece. So even though they're devoting more time and energy towards that information than younger adults, you still see um, that younger adults perform better than older. So even though distraction and attention are indeed related to memory, there seems to be something above and beyond that, that that's going a bit wrong in older adults. Moving on, uh, true to say then, if you have new memory, if you don't use it or in some way rehearse it again, it, it gets lost. Yes, probably, likely, yes. And there are variations within there, of course. Um, so some memories might require more rehearsal um, than other memories. Um, so if there's some research to indicate that perhaps emotional information um, might be better remembered than uh, neutral information and might not need as much rehearsal that there was some evidence to suggest otherwise as well but so there could be some variation within there but um, but of course as a general rule certainly rehearse the information integrated into other knowledge and that's your best bet at keeping it there yes uh, there does seem to be a connection, particularly there's um, Adam Anderson uh, from the University of Toronto has done some really lovely work showing uh, with his students, uh, Josh Sussman, I believe is his name, um, showing that if you're in a um, if you're in a bad mood, your um, the amount of information you can take in is restricted. Um, if you're in a good mood, the amount of information or the amount of information you can sort of see in your environment is expanded. So that alone could probably have some effect. Um, if you're focused in on a narrow piece of information, um, then you might not have memory for all of the surrounding information as well. Um, also, one of my graduate students, Lily Riggs, has done some work to show um, that emotion, uh, the presence of emotional information will direct your attention in different ways. So you might be very attracted to study that piece of, um, of emotionally charged information um, to the detriment of, of looking at attending to um, some other pieces of information that can have an effect on your memory. So if you're zoned in on an emotionally charged piece, um, then you're going to, it's going to impair your memory for the other neutral things that are around it. So there is some interaction between the emotion and memory. It's an amazingly complicated uh, system that we have. Thankfully, or else I'd be out of a job. <laughs> so I'm happy for that. Well with it. <laughs> there is one phrase that you used that uh, amused me earlier on. You, you had on one of your, your pieces of information. I'm not, I'm not finding the words as quickly That's as okay. I used to. That's okay. um, Non-human animals. Right. Um, is this a new approach to, to um, <laughs> categorizing uh, sentient beings? <laughs> um, maybe. I, uh, it's just uh, perhaps the, I mean, we're all, we're all animals we as well, animals. so trying to distinguish yeah the human variety versus the non-human variety. It's like that joke of the little boy who runs home from school at his first day in, in some class of biology. He encounters his dad and runs up to him and he says, Dad, did you know mummy is a mammal? <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> That's cute. Yeah, so just trying to be, you know, cor correct in sort of explaining which, which um, categories of populations we're looking at. That's <laughs> good. Okay. Any other questions at all? Lots, but we're out of time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate you coming. Thank you. Thank you.